Hi, I'm Megan Smick, the pastor at Oregon United Methodist Church. We've been following along with Reverend Adam Hamilton of the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City, looking at hope that we find in the scriptures. We've talked about hope in the Psalms, the prophets, the gospels, the epistles, and today we turn to the book of Revelation. And I'm gonna start with a true confession. When I began reading the last book of the Harry Potter series, the first thing that I did was turn to the last chapter and skim it. It's not that I wanted to spoil the ending, but if Harry, Ron, or Hermione was dead at the end, I would have felt like I had completely wasted my time reading the whole book. Well, it turns out that they're healthy at the end, and it actually ends with a future of hope for all of them. And so I read the rest of the book with confidence. The book of Revelation is a little bit like that. It's the last book in the Bible, and we want it to end well with victory and hope. And the book of Revelation does not disappoint. It was written to be a book of hope. It was sent to the seven churches in Asia Minor in a time of great disorder. And it tells us that disorder will not have the final word in our lives. Revelation uh, kind of gets a poor reputation for being difficult to understand and just plain weird. And so we often avoid it. But some of the most beautiful and hopeful words in the Bible are in this book. It, I think really what turns us off is that it's written in a specific form called apocalyptic. It's a style of writing that was popular about 100 years before and 100 years after Christ. Apocalyptic uses striking visual images that move us emotionally and tell the story of God's power over evil, hate, sin, and death. Its aim is to speak in words and pictures that affect our deepest feelings, but don't necessarily make sense intellectually. It's kind of like a Picasso painting. The images seem strange and even bizarre, and they don't make a lot of sense but they create an emotional reaction within us. That's revelation. It's strange, it's even bizarre and a little weird, and it doesn't seem rational, but it instills powerful feelings. Let's go back for a minute to why it was written. Sometime in the last third of the first century, Rome was led by a disturbed man named Nero. Now, Nero had suffered some failures of his policies, and he decided that a way out of his troubles would be to make Christians scapegoats for him, and so he blamed them. And he rounded them up, and he had them killed publicly for sport. He didn't just execute them. He had them killed in horrific ways for the entertainment of the public. Peter and Paul were killed around this time. Also around this time, Jews in Jerusalem rebelled against Roman rule. Nero responded with a bloodbath. His forces massacred one million Jewish men, women, and children. Also, as if that wasn't bad enough, around this time, emperor worship was becoming mandatory in the Roman Empire. Nero expected to be called Lord and God. In Asia Minor, that's in western Turkey of our day, the cities there were centers of this emperor worship. Each of the cities mentioned in Revelation had a temple to Roma, and to the empire, where citizens were expected to offer sacrifices. And if they didn't, they were a traitor, and there were consequences to that. 
the author of Revelation, John, was in exile on the island of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation. He was a victim of all that Christians were enduring at this time. So this was a difficult time to be a Christian, to say the least. And some of the Christians in Asia Minor, where this emperor worship was really being enforced, began to lose their faith and turn away from the church. And can we even really blame him after all that they were going through? It was into this situation that John wrote his apocalyptic vision of the victory of God over the forces of evil and death. He wrote it to give the churches hope and encouragement in the midst of all their challenges. The book begins with John's vision of Jesus, as Jesus shares specific words to each of the churches, offering them first a word of encouragement. And so we hear in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 3, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. And then for each church, following these words of encouragement, there is a word of correction. And so this vision of Jesus continues in verses 4 and 5. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. This is a pattern for each of the seven churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Following these words of encouragement and correction, we have John's vision of God's heavenly throne, a lion and a lamb, scrolls and seals and horsemen, a dragon, and an evil woman who is said to represent Babylon, but really, truly stands for Rome. It's all very strange and confusing to us, but remember, we aren't the intended audience. First century Christians in the churches of Asia Minor would have understood this symbolism, and they would have understood the style of apocalyptic, and they would have been moved to feelings of sadness and rage and ultimately hope and gratitude and praise. And why the hope and gratitude and praise? Well, all throughout these strange and scary visions, God is reigning. And in chapter 19, Christ rides in on a white horse. Do you recognize that symbolism? And evil is completely and utterly defeated. And then we hear these beautiful and hopeful words from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain 
will be no more, for the first things have passed away. John is telling us that the Roman Empire and the evil and hate and corruption and death that it stood for would not have the final word. God was, would create a new world where evil did not exist, saying, he's saying, you are going to make it through this, if not in this life, then on the other side. Then John makes an important connection, and he ties up some loose ends. You will remember that human life began in a garden. God created humanity, and he put us in the Garden of Eden. And at the center of it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Later on in the story, Jesus dies on a tree, and he is buried in a garden where he also rose again. With that in mind, listen to these words from Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. We are supposed to live our lives knowing that this will happen. We are supposed to work on bringing it forth in the world. It is our destiny and our destination. We have nothing to fear. Revelation was written for people in a time of great disorder, but it points to a time when God will reorder everything. And it's saying it in the most evocative way possible so that we feel it in our bones, that hate and evil and suffering will never, never have the last word. You know, people without hope tend to be pretty self-focused. They look out for number one. They're often angry about a lot of perceived threats because they can't see a future of being better than the present unless they can grab everything they can for themselves. Because we have hope, we don't have to live that way. We know God is looking out for us, planning a future that is better than the present. So let's let that hope make us more gentle, more kind, more loving and forgiving people. The book of Revelation ends. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. God's gift of a future of hope is for the people that you love. It's for strangers. It's for the immigrant. It's for people 
of all races and nations. It's for the poor and the rich, the marginalized and the powerful. It's for people that you disagree with. It's for Democrats and Republicans. And best of all, it's for you. God's gift of a future of hope is for everyone. In the end, God triumphs. Goodness reigns. Christ is the victor. And you are going to be okay. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Creator God, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the beginning and the end, our salvation and redemption. In your hands, all our challenges are swept up into your good purposes. By your grace, send us your hope. Turn our souls to sing hallelujahs all our days, because you reign in heaven and on earth, wherever our hearts are open to you. In the name of Jesus, riding in on a white horse to save us all. Amen. And now may the peace of the Holy Spirit reign in your life. The hope of Jesus make clear your path, and the love of God shelter you always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.